Well, firstly, as I say, thank you for, for letting me join you. I'm really delighted to have a chance to, to join you. Um, what I was told is that I've got 20 minutes, but I'm going to make 15 minutes for what I'm going to say and then five minutes for questions. So I imagine you put questions in the chat or whatever you do. i uh, be delighted to engage in that. Let me start really, though, with a, with a paying tribute to all of you. Uh, it's now a year, really, isn't it, with this dreadful pandemic that we're all facing. And I have to say, it's extraordinarily hard. I have lots of friends still working in, in the NHS here in England and friends around the world. And I know just how tired people are getting, how beaten down by some of the things that have been happening to people. And it really has been tremendous. Um, I mean, I think we all owe a great debt of gratitude to nurses in particular, but health workers in general all over the world for what's been going on. So uh, let me pay my tribute to you um, uh, and uh, thank you for what you're doing, but also say that even despite all that, you're thinking about the future and that's really courageous and great and just what you should be doing. So thank you for that. Now, I'm not a nurse. In fact, I'm not a clinician of any sort, um, but I do know a bit about specialist nursing. I was chief executive of the Oxford Teaching Hospital, or specifically the John Radcliffe and the Churchill Hospitals, if people know them in Oxford, in the 1990s. Um, and I seem to have sent my message on earlier um, uh, in the 1990s. And it was there that I learned about specialist nursing. I learned about, you know, we had a wonderful wound care, care nurse. Um, we had great cardiac nurses, great cardiac nurses who actually made an enormous difference in terms of how we treated patients, not only with humanity and, uh, and, and, and care, but also in terms of how effectively we could treat people and actually how quickly we could treat people. And I learned the importance of nursing in Oxford, um, probably more than anywhere else in my career in, in, in the NHS. Um, and it's partly that reason, but it's even more my experience in Africa over the last few years that has made me convinced that actually one of the most important things we can do, one of the biggest things we can do to improve health globally is to support and develop our nurses. And that obviously means specialist nurses, but it means nurses more generally. Too often, as you all know, uh, nurses are undervalued, not able to work to what the Americans talk of as the top of your license you know, being able to deliver everything that you can do. Um, and that's, apart from a waste of all that passion and expertise and energy, it's also uh, an extraordinary waste of resources as well, isn't it? Um, so that's why I have become so convinced of that we need to do more to strengthen nursing. And it's why I set up the Nursing Now campaign. Now, the Nursing Now campaign, in case you don't know, is a three-year campaign which actually finished, but it's, we've extended it by six months this year. And so it's going to finish in, in May, but it started in, in, in 2018. And it's a three-year campaign to improve health by raising the profile and status of nursing. So it's really a health campaign. This is about improving health. It's also a nursing campaign as well. But actually our focus is, you know, and the reason for doing it is because actually by supporting nurses raising your profile and raising your status, we will have a bigger impact on improving health. And if you and your country or your, 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 your colleagues are part of the Nursing Now campaign, well, you are not alone. Uh, this is just a few of the, from around the world, you can tell by the headscarves and others where, where, where people are, are, are from, from around the world. Um, uh, that's Malaysia, isn't it, on the top left there. So we, we've had this extraordinary range of energy and, uh, 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 and commitment of people joining in our campaign to raise the profile and status of nursing. And indeed, if you look at the world map, in February 2018, we started off, and in December 2020, we had 700 plus regional, national and local groups in extraordinarily 126 countries. Now, there are only 200 countries in the world overall, so it's a pretty good coverage. Um, and can I tell you that most recently, the people who joined the campaign were, were China um, in, in the autumn, Russia in December, and actually Saudi Arabia in, in January. Um, so we're really spreading into all parts of the uh, uh, all parts of the world. And I guess probably all the big countries, the biggest countries in the world are, are, are part of it. So you are you are not alone in part of this. And there's this great movement. Now it's coming to its end. Um, and it comes to an end at the same time as we um, 
uh, have come to the end of the 2020 International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, which is one of the things we asked the WHO uh, to do, uh, and, and they agreed to, to create last year as the year of the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. But we need to leverage the momentum of the campaign to create a lasting legacy. And I'm going to tell you about three particular things here, or two, two in particular. One is that firstly, our Nursing Now groups, the 700 plus groups around the world, have been invited to join and link in with the International Council of Nurses. Really important point that they become part of the, the, the representative body uh, for nurses globally. Uh, and I know a lot of them are doing so. And the ICN are developing services to continue to support the groups. So if groups want to continue or change their name, um, or, or continue with what they're doing, uh, then they'll be able to do so with support from ICN. And I think that's really important. The second thing that is, of course, uh, continuing is you may have seen, I hope you've seen that in uh, April last year, the WHO, in association with ourselves at Nursing Now and the International Council of Nursing, um, created the first ever state of the world's nursing report. If you haven't seen it, look it up on the WHO website. You'll find it has a, it is a mass of detail. It is the data. It is the, what we know about nursing globally. And it's the first time it's been gathered together and I'm sure it won't be the last. And it draws out from that some important proposals for investing in education, in jobs and in leadership to support nursing globally and improve health for all. Again, the theme that this is about improving health um, but what's important about this, as well as having that initial repository of data, is that this is going to be followed up this year at the World Health Assembly in May with the publication of strategic directions for nursing. So the beginnings of a strategy, and there'll be a lot of debate of this over the next year. So in the regional uh, groupings, and we're including the European region, uh, of course, there should be debate and discussion of the strategic directions for nursing. And people like you need to make sure that the European region of the WHO do that. I'm sure they will. But also this year, the WHO has actually followed on the year of the nurse and the midwife by the International Year of Health and Care Workers. And they've done so under the headings, and it's quite a good strap line, this, isn't it? Protect, protect our health workers. And that means PPE and, uh, and so on, protective equipment and so on, invest and together. This is about the world together and not just about ourselves in our individual countries. And actually, of course, it's about the team of health workers of which nurses are at the heart, but not, of course, the only members. So there's a really important follow up uh, work here around this um, uh, state of the world's nursing report. Uh, and in fact, we are uh, hoping that we will we, we, we're going to have a, a set of conferences on May the 24th this year, the opening day of the World Health Assembly, uh, which will start in Australia, we believe, and follow the sun around the world. So an hour and a half in different parts of the world, um, celebrating the end of the campaign, but the movement through to the future. And we will certainly have one in Europe and great nurses, whom, some of whom you know, perhaps from, from the European Commission, people like uh, Adela Zabelegui, I always get it wrong, from Spain, who's on our board, um, uh, uh, and um, Elizabeth Adams, the head of the European uh, Council of Nurses and so on. So uh, we will have a good European event then. But the third thing in follow-up is that we launched uh, uh, two years ago, the, nurse, the Nightingale Challenge, which was a challenge to all employers of nurses. That's the hospitals, the health authorities, the governments, the private providers to identify 20 or so young nurses and midwives and give them some development in 2020, provide development opportunities for young nurses and midwives. Um, and development opportunities, not clinical ones, but ones about leadership, about understanding the system, about advocacy, about all those other things which you as professionals bring to the party and to demonstrate that nursing and midwifery are exciting and rewarding careers. This we, we, we aimed for saying we wanted 20,000 young nurses and midwives involved. Actually, last count, we've got 31,000 uh, young nurses and midwives involved from something like 75 countries. Um, and it's been so successful that the Burdett Trust for Nursing, who has funded much of this, um, are going to continue it for the next two years, and we expect it to continue thereafter. Now, think about this for the future. I noticed Corinne's um, comments, uh, uh, was it Corinne's comments, but the, um, 
uh, Tam Tamsin's comments, comments was it about young nurses coming into speciality nursing uh, earlier. Um, these are the future. You know, these we, we say young nurses, nurses of 35 and under is how we've defined young, although of course we're all young um, uh, on this video, aren't we? Um, but um, they're the future. And can you imagine there's a network now of 31,000 young nurses and midwives around the world, how powerful that could be. And if it's added to next year and next year, this is going to be a really growing network. And you've got to use the power of that network, I think, to make change happen uh, and, and to create the future uh, as we've been talking about it. So those are the, some of the things we're following on Nursing Now. So the Nursing Now campaign was always intended to be three years and to try and make a step change but actually there's generational change needed here as you will understand better than i do that this will take a long time but we're moving we're moving in the, in, in the right direction and let me talk again about why i think nurses are so important um, and why i think nursing will become ever more and even more important in the future and there are a number of reasons for this and they're shown on this slide firstly diseases are changing i don't need to tell you that um, but, you know, we've got this big increase if we leave aside the pandemic, where nurses, of course, have been in the front line in every sense. Um, but we think about the biggest burdens of disease, even including infectious diseases, which are the non-communicable diseases, uh, the non-infectious diseases, um, that whole area from cancer to diabetes to asthma to dementia uh, and so on. And if you think, as you all know better than I do, uh, about the, need, the, the way that patients in those areas need care, it fits perfectly with nursing. Um, and indeed we have seen, haven't we, and I see on the call here, uh, uh, a range of people uh, lead, lead nurses in diabetes and so on. You know, we are increasingly seeing nurses taking the lead in the biggest areas of where, um, where, where, where the disease is moving, where the burden of disease is. So epidemiologically, technology will be pushing forward the importance of nursing. But so will the way in which I think all of us are starting to see health. We're moving away from a purely biological model of the world, and we're thinking more, much more in terms, aren't we, of a biopsychosocial and indeed environmental view of health, recognizing all those determinants of health. Um, and that, of course, as I understand it, fits very well with the way you are educated uh, as nurses to take that bigger perspective that more holistic view of health. And that's the way the world is moving. I think there are also big arguments about value and quality, quality in particular the areas of person-centered care, but also value for money. But here's a really big point, and this is for the older nurses amongst you. You have created a track record. Yeah? Some of the things we're talking about now in, in nursing, we couldn't have thought about much 30 years ago, or we could have thought about them, but we couldn't point at them. But in my country, I can now point at people, say, look, that's what a specialist nurse does. That's why you need nurses leading in, diab in diabetes. That's why you need nurses in cardiac surgery um, to being, being specialists or nurse consultants. So there's track record and there's evidence and it wasn't there before. So the timing has changed. Another important point, a big point about society is that nursing is not a gendered profession. And you know, great credit to all the men in nursing as well as the women in nursing. Um, but it is a majority, majority of nurses um, are women and the changing status of women is affecting how nurses are seeing. Um, and my observation from around the world as part of this campaign is the way nurses are treated in a country relates very strongly to how women are treated in that country as well. So there's a big gender perspective here and a changing one. And then finally, COVID. Um, and what's happened with COVID, as I'm sure in my country, and I'm sure in other countries as well, is that we have seen a real increase in recognition of the importance of nursing. We've got an interesting pair of phenomena happening at the moment. One is that some of the older nurses, some of the people who've been in the profession for a long time, are saying that they can see that you know, they're tired, that actually when this is over, they want to retire, they want to move on or they want to break. But we've got record numbers of people coming in at the other end. We've got record numbers of people applying for training and education in all the health professions, but particularly in nursing. Nursing, I think, has achieved a big profile boost um, because of COVID, unintended, uh, unexpected. And of course, none of us wanted COVID, but it is something that I think is changing the environment. So what does that mean for the future we're creating? 
Well, it means, as I've said, nurse-led clinics, more, many more nurse-led clinics, specialist nurses uh, and more nurse practitioners. Again, in our country, we've got a lot of emergency nurse um, first responders uh, uh, as practitioners. Um, I think actually another area where, where nurses are going to be playing a much bigger role in the future is primary care and community services, of course, and particularly uh, care at home. Bizarrely, in my country, we've been reducing the number of community nurses, but we need to reverse that <laughs> from where we are. And I suspect that primary care in the longer term will become essentially nurse-led. Um, that would be my perspective on it. Over 20 years, I think we will see um, that it will be nurse-based with doctors and pharmacists and all kinds of other people linking in. But the continuity of care uh, in, in the primary setting, I think, will be led very strongly by, by nurses. And you can see that starting to happen in some places. And then finally, uh, the other area, of course, is in public health uh, and in what I call health creation. Uh, let me just take one minute on this. I think I, I've probably got time to do that. In health, we always talk about the causes of ill health. When are we going to start talking about the causes of health? Um, and there's some really important stuff that is done around sometimes called sanitogenesis, but it goes back to the Greeks, actually, in terms of how we live our lives. Um, and I recently have taken a, a big interest uh, and, and written a lot around creating health as opposed to just preventing disease. Um, and I think nurses can play a great role in that. Um, and I use a, a, an expression I learned from an African friend, health is made at home, hospitals are for repairs. Um, now, I know hospitals do more than that, but you get the point. You know, it's actually schools and what happens in, in schools and work and at home and in the family and our relationships that create health. So there's the future as I see it. And, and if you look at that little chart there, you can see why we well, can see why I created nursing now. You know, uh, I mean, this is uh, really important that we uh, build on what you have achieved. And remember, you have achieved with your track record as specialist nurses and other people in other, in other parts of nursing uh, to make things happen. So let me finish on this note about taking action, because I know you wanted to ask me about what I uh, uh, thought you could do to raise your profile and so on. Um, three quick bits here. I mean, of course, there is advocacy and you've got to keep finding all the platforms for advocating things and you've got to find all the ways of engagement You've got to get onto boards. You've got to respond to consultation. You've got to join in. You've got to think your voice is important um, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and that's important. And that's all part of all of this. You've got to, you've got, you've got to meet people and talk to them and explain your story. Um, and you've got to have the evidence and that's increasingly there. But evidence is never quite enough, enough by itself. Making change happens not just with evidence. It happens because people buy into it, because they get your point, they understand what you're talking about. And some of that is about stories and allies. Um, it's about telling stories about COVID and, and what happened and why the nurses were doing this and getting people to understand that, but also finding people outside the profession, like me, but outside the profession to be your advocates. Because talking about yourself and saying how good you are is one thing, having other people also saying how good you are, that actually reinforces it massively. A um, very brief story um, from my time as chief executive of the NHS. In 2003 or four, I can't quite remember, we introduced prescribing for nurses. Um, so prescribing from a, a limited pharmacopoeia originally, and of course, taking additional training be before doing that. Um, and the biggest advocates, uh, the biggest opposition to it was the doctors, and the biggest advocates for it was the doctors. I leave the nurses aside. So I had doctors coming to me and saying, you've got to, you've got to let these, these nurses know what they're talking about. They were talking about uh, the people actually who, who really came to me were the palliative care doctors. They say, our specialist nurses, you know, we agree at what point you're going to increase the, the opiates or whatever. You know, we, we know what we're doing. You don't, you don't, you can find me to sign a bit of paper. Um, you know, this is part of a team. Um, that, that's how we work. Um, uh, and they, as doctors were in some ways more convincing than you as nurses. And I'm sure you can understand that, that, and that's not just about the power of the doctors, it's about people from outside saying this is important um, as well. So it was the doctors and nurses making that advocacy. They came to me as chief executive. And then of course we had to deal with the opposition and we had to lay out the evidence. We took a year. We took a year of really looking at the detail of it and set up expert panels and so on. So we did it really seriously. But what mattered was people got it. 
what mattered in the end was that Tony Blair as our prime minister understood. Um, he got the story and he heard it from more than one person. And then finally on taking action, join in. Make sure you're linked in regionally as you are obviously in, 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 in this European uh, group, uh, but also uh, nationally in your own country, but, but globally as well. Contribute to the consultations uh, wherever you have them. And then finally, well, thank you for listening to me and good luck for the future. And my final sort of takeaway message is do retain hope and ambition and energy. It's a long journey. This isn't gonna be sorted out in five years and 10 years or whatever. I, I mean, and I know I've, I've, I've met colleagues, nurses in Spain and Italy, I think of visits I made, what is obviously 18 months ago now, uh, talking with them about what specialisms were developing and what a long journey it is um, to, to take. But it's a journey that you can make and a journey that you can create and a journey that you can use COVID uh, and, and your experience to date to accelerate. So on that note, very happy to take a few questions if there's still time. Um, and thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing this screen.